Question for you real quick. Don't raise your hand. First service, people raise their hands. Have you ever been drunk? <laughs> I know some of you raise your hands anyway. I appreciate your transparency. How about this? Have you ever seen anybody or known anyone, uh, been around anybody who's been drunk? How about that? Okay, we can raise our hands for that one, right? Yeah, that's a safe one. Um, you know, when people, when they get under the influence, um, a lot of times they don't know they're drunk. You ever been around somebody like that? And they, you know, they just keep on and they keep on. And the problem is, is they think they're perfectly fine, but in reality, they're not fine. And they have to have somebody come along and say, listen, you're not fine. You got to stop. Give me your keys. I mean, you know, somebody has to intervene. And the problem with this is that oftentimes when you are under the influence, the influence sneaks up on you and you don't realize it until it's too late. And I want to make sure that we, as citizens of the kingdom of God, make sure that we are under the influence of the kingdom of God and that we are serving Jesus Christ in the influences of the culture and the world that surrounds us does not affect what we think and what we do. And we have to be really careful about that. This last week, we had an election that was a difficult dividing time in our world. And some of you are very happy with the outcome and some of you are not very happy with the outcome. And the ironic thing is that those that are happy now weren't happy in the previous election and vice versa. And that's the way our democracy works. But I'm far more concerned today with the conduct that many of us exhibited or showed in the weeks and months leading up to last Tuesday, whether we acted like we were under the influence of Jesus Christ as citizens of the kingdom of God, or whether we acted like we were under the influence of the culture that surrounds us. Because we know that as Christians, we're supposed to be informed, we're supposed to be concerned, we're supposed to vote our conscience as informed by scripture. But in the words of the great band 38 special, we have to hold on loosely, but we don't let go. But some of you have held on so tight that it's made you physically sick, that you've ruined relationships. Some families have been divided, some friends lost, some damage done. And unfortunately, when we say that we're citizens of the kingdom of God, what we do and how we do it, it reflects on Jesus. So Jesus was talking in his first sermon in Matthew chapter five, and he was talking, he was preaching to a, a large crowd. The crowds always grew when Jesus preached. He would start off oftentimes with just a few and end up with thousands. And in this particular time, the crowd had grown and it was quite large, but Jesus did a little sidebar, almost like if we were in our church service this morning, and I said, listen, I need you guys to talk amongst yourselves. And I asked our church staff, would you just step out into the hall with me real quick? I need to talk to you guys about some things. And that would be a little awkward, wouldn't it? For you, you'd be sort of chatting amongst yourselves, but yet I would wanna make sure they were on the same page. I'd be like, listen, I'm getting ready to drop some knowledge on you, some things, some principles that you gotta grasp because they're gonna be asking questions. And so we have to be united. And so Jesus kind of sidebarred with his disciples and potentially their families or whoever else was with them and in this little breakout session, begin to speak to them. And of course, others overheard. And he says these things, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And you're like, well, salt doesn't lose its salt. I mean, I buy some Morton's and put it in a salt shaker. And five years later, I come back and it's, it's still salty. But in Jesus day, the alkaline value is different in salt and it didn't last as long and it would lose its effectiveness. And I don't know the chemistry behind it. I'm not a scientist. I just have studied history. And when a, a, a salt product, a salt block became unuseful, they had two choices. The way they threw it out, they could throw it in their fields or they could throw it in the road. And if you threw salt in a field, it still had an erosive property to it and it would kill the crops. So they would throw it in the street where people walked. And when Jesus was talking about this, he was, it was obvious exactly what he meant. He says, 
you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. Now pay attention to that. It's no longer good for anything when salt loses its saltiness. Now, what did Jesus say? You are the salt. You are the salt of what? The earth. Now the earth doesn't include just the people who think like you and act like you and dress like you and drive what you drive and vote the way you do or go to the same church you do or even live in the same country that you do. Jesus says you, us, were the salt of the earth. That there perhaps is a bigger principle in play. And you say, well, what does salt mean? What is he getting at? And salt, the analogy that Jesus is using is very simple, it's influence. Now he goes on in a minute and talks about light, which are the gospel words that we speak. But this first little introduction, he says, listen, you are the influence to the earth, to the world, to your people, to my people, to our people, to the people you like, the ones you don't like, the ones you agree with, the ones you don't agree with, the ones where you would throw your hands up and say, how could you even be a Christian if you believe that? Those are the same kinds of people that Jesus includes in the you. And he says, you're supposed to live your life in a way where you influence them. Toward what? Toward the gospel. So when they observe your life, they say there's something different about you. What we've chosen to say, what we've chosen to post, what we've chosen not to say, what we've chosen not to post, our level of anxiety that we share, our optimism or our pessimism, and the way that people see that is not by us being separatists and hanging out in just small groups of people who are exactly like us, but just like Jesus did living in a world that is a marketplace of ideas. And he said, you're supposed to influence by the way you live. So the converse, the flip side is stop being so alienating. Stop being so obnoxious. Stop creating so much friction. Because these are the same people who ideally you would want to walk up beside and put your arm around and nudge toward the kingdom of God. And if they look at you and they say, I remember how you acted. I remember what you said. I remember what you did. I remember how frantic you were. I remember how anxious. Why would I want that kind of frantic anger, anxiety, pessimism, negativity, division? Why would I want that in my life? Well, the reason that it's there in the first place is because we're not living as citizens of the kingdom of God. We're living as citizens of this world. And Jesus in the book of Matthew also said, upon this rock, I will build my church. But he never said on this rock, the gospel, I'll build my government or my country. No, I'm a patriot. I love our country. Been all over the world. And this is where I want to live. I enjoy the freedom we have and the cost that people paid. And you'll hear later in the service to preserve that freedom. It means so much to me. But I'm first and foremost, a citizen of the kingdom. And my job is to be salty. And so is yours. And some of us have failed. So Jesus says, if the salt loses its saltiness, how could it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Your influence is gone. Without influence, nobody wants to hear what you have to say. Have I belabored that point enough? If you ask me, which you didn't, but I have the mic, so I get to say it. Um, I think over the last 50 years, the church has done a pretty good job, not this church, but church in America, of losing its saltiness. 
I think that the church in general in America has become way too political. I think it's become way too preoccupied with things that aren't really kingdom oriented. And I feel like that we've become so polarizing and alienating that we have fought what we consider God's battles with the devil's means. And I think everybody else sees it except for us oftentimes. And the church in general has lost its saltiness. And one of the things that I want us to do is to regain that saltiness so that the way we live and conduct each other, our lives, the way we relate to each other, the way we relate to the world, it's attractional and not polarizing. So Jesus goes on, right? He's got this little thing going on with his disciples. He says, and by the way, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Now they built their hills back or their towns back in Jesus' day on hills. Sometimes we build cities on hills, but oftentimes we build cities by rivers and places where transportation is easy or you know, there's fertile land nearby. They built most of their little towns up on hills for a couple of reasons. One, they could be visible at night because it was dangerous to travel at night and many people had to find some place to, uh, to, to arrive and be taken care of, hospitality. The other reason was that there were marauder soldiers, or not soldiers, but thieves and thugs that would come and attack. And so if you were, had the high ground, then you were in a superior tactical position so you could defend your village on the high ground. And so when Jesus you know, said the city here on the hill, um, they would understand. And there were a couple customs that were common in Jesus' day. One was that as soon as the, the light, the sun went down, a candle or a lamp would be lit. I have dusk to dawn lights at my house. You know, it has a little eye on the light bulb. You pay a little extra for them. And as soon as the light drops down to a certain level, the light bulb comes on like magic. And then when the sun comes up in the morning, it goes off. LED lasts longer than I'm gonna last. And so I don't have to worry about it. They had to worry about it because they had to light a lamp every evening. And it was cultural. It was, it was courteous. It was a custom. Usually it was the lady of the house would light the lamp, a terracotta lamp about six inches by five inches. They would put it out by the door and each house would have a little light next to it, which symbolized a couple things, safety, hospitality, and home. And Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Your life, what you do and what you say should symbolize safety, hospitality, and home. Now, I know some people, they don't like trick-or-treating and I get that. If you don't trick-or-treat, that's perfectly fine. It's up to you. Um, I trick-or-treated with my little granddaughter and we had a blast. But there's a universal sign in neighborhoods of whether you knock on a door or whether you don't knock on a door, right? What's the sign? Anybody know? If the light's on, you want somebody to come. If the light is off, then that means do not come. You're going to be disappointed. You turn your light off. It means we don't want visitors. You turn the light off. You mean, it means either I'm not there or what I'm doing, I don't want you to be part of. And Jesus says, literally, for the love of God, keep your light on. Don't you want people to come? Don't you want them to experience safety, hospitality, home? And he goes on with this example. He says, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Now in the King James Version, which I don't use very often for a reason, but the King James Version says that you don't light your candle and put it under a bushel. And I think a bushel is a funny word. I just like saying that, a bushel. Um, you can't really work it into your normal everyday life because people look at you weird, but a bushel, it's about 32 quarts. It's a unit of measure and a bowl that was big enough to cover or contain a bushel. They would sometimes call a bushel and that's what Jesus meant. Everybody got it. For us, it could be a five gallon bucket. Easy enough, right? You don't wanna cover up your dusk to dawn light with a five gallon bucket. Who would do that? Same kind of an analogy, just a different time period, a different day. He said, instead, you put your light on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine for other people as they are looking for the same safety, hospitality, 
home with Jesus and in heaven as you are. But why would you put the bucket over the light? Well, sometimes the culture puts the bucket over the light and you and I become under the influence. We've had one too many. It sneaks up on us and we begin to think and do things that we wouldn't normally do as citizens of the kingdom of God. And somebody has to come alongside and say, wait a second, give me your keys. We gotta go a different direction. So they put it on a stand, it gives light to everyone. And we are supposed to allow this light to shine so that others can see our good deeds, the way we live, the way we love each other, the way we treat the world around us, what we say, and glorify our Father in heaven. Now this last phrase is where I want us to end this first little section together. And Jesus uses Father in heaven on purpose, and it's not the only time he uses it, but the first word Father means Abba. It means Daddy. And I don't know what your relationship with your dad was like or is like, but pretend you have a dad who you go to when you are in trouble, who is non-judgmental, who provides support and help and an encouragement, who looks and asks, how can I add value to my kid and ultimately bring about good for them in their life? Not give them everything they want, not be permissive. That's a bad father, but work toward their good. Compassionate and tender, non-judgmental. Pretend you have that kind of father, Abba. And he says, I want them to see your compassionate, sensitive, soft-hearted, gentle, loving father. But he also says in heaven, which is a reminder of the powerful nature of God, that he has a plan and a purpose, that he controls the outcome of events and that he works all things, good things and bad things together for good for all those who are willing to live their life for him and allowing God to live out his purpose. And Jesus said, I want people to see that far more than I want them to see. Anything else you might think you wanna show. So don't lose your saltiness and let your light shine. Well, I've got a video that I wanna share with you where a good friend of mine, part of our Cap City Church family has made an intentional choice to continue to be salty and to be a light, even though there were things both in his past and present that work against him. God's had an amazing victory. Let's watch this together. Hey, good morning, church family. This is Pastor Rick, and I'm here with a good friend of mine, Keith McMillan, and both of us together want to tell you Happy Veterans Day. Now, tomorrow is Veterans Day, but today in our worship service, I want to tell you Happy Veterans Day, and if you have served our country in one of our uh, divisions or branches of our armed forces, thank you for your service. Now, Keith, you're here with me today, and you have served. You're a veteran. Yes, sir. You're also a really good friend of mine and also a part of Capital City Church. Yes, sir. And it's been my privilege to be able to get to know Keith personally um, as a friend, but I've asked him to share a little bit about his past, his history, his service to our country, and also his faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, uh, Keith, thank you for being willing to talk with me to our church family. No, and, I appreciate it. It's my honor. Well, you've been around a couple of years at Cap City, yes, right? Yes, sir. And uh, you used to sit on the very back row, and, and you've moved up a little bit now. And uh, I joked with you and said, I thought it was my preaching. You just couldn't quite get enough of that. But then I came to find out that it might have been a, a, uh, a repercussion of some of the injuries that you'd faced with your hearing yes, back sir. when you were serving. So I was patting myself on the back and then realized that it wasn't me. Uh, but um, you did serve. Talk to me a little bit about that. So I was in the United States Army for 14 years. Uh, I served in 82nd Airborne Corps and then also 35th Signal Brigade and then eventually in the 7th Group Special Forces. Um, I was a weapons specialist. I was 11 Bravo, a combat communicator, uh, a variety of jobs. Yeah. 
So that's a lot right there. And you've told me a little bit about that. You jumped out of a lot of planes, right? Yes, sir. Uh, with a parachute. Yes. Most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I've jumped out of more planes than I've landed in. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then fast roped and yes. uh, had all sorts of experiences that um, many of us have never had before. Yes. All one of the days were. <laughs> it wasn't always fun, though, was it? No, sir. When you served. You were deployed multiple times. Yes, sir. Three. Yeah, three different times. Yes. And, um, and you were in combat. Yes, sir. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about that part of your service? I served in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and uh, saw a lot, of, a lot of things that are not normal. Right. Yes. And as much as you were trained part of the special forces, you could never be fully prepared for anything that you would experience yep. in, in war. Yes, sir. And not only were you there, but you had a wife, Heather, uh, yes. and uh, she was stateside with your boys. Yes. Um, watching the news. I can't imagine how hard it would have been for her to... to yes. You know. uh, serve a, a spouse. I think it, their service is just as honorable yeah. as in the veteran itself. Yeah. They're the ones staying home being the glue that holds the family together, yeah. uh, watching the news, waiting for that phone call, yeah. uh, or God forbid, that knock on the door. Right, yeah, and, and I'm thankful that, um, that God protected you and that you came home. Uh, a lot of people who you served with and a lot of your friends weren't so fortunate, and they yes, left sir. wives and families um, without them. Mm -hmm. And um, man, God, God was gracious to you. Yes, sir. Um, what is it? that you are most proud of or most uh, grateful for for your time in the military when you look back? That I was able to serve my country. Yeah. Um, freedom does not come free. Right. And I did write that check mm -hmm. for up to payable to my life, and I knew that. I was okay with that. Right. Because uh, I knew where I was going. Yeah. I, I knew that uh, God was with me. Right. I knew that Christ walked beside me. Right. And so, you know, your faith... Uh, while you were deployed, gave you the confidence to face death. Um, you were injured, exposed to chemicals and, and yes. warfare and all sorts of things that the body was just never, yeah, never uh, intended to endure. Yes, sir. And uh, came back with uh, things that you've had to live with since yes, then. Are you comfortable sharing any of those with us? Uh, I struggle with uh, femoral nerve damage, with degenerative disc disease, uh, hearing loss asthma, heart condition, mm -hmm. and uh, tinnitus, sleep apnea, and also PTSD. Right. She went through um, some unbelievably difficult times. And yes, sir. Without going into to too much detail, you were in the middle of it. Yes, sir. And experienced the worst of it. All of it. Right. Yeah. So when you look back on your time of service, what have been the hardest things for you? The hardest, um, what's the hardest part? Living through the the thoughts, living through the memories, being in that dark place where the darkness surrounds you and you don't know what direction to go. Yeah. Um, being in that spot to where you don't know if you want to go on. And so for the last couple of decades after you've left the military, there have been some really tough times, some really hard times. You've talked to me uh, very openly about your faith in Christ, and you know the reality of Jesus in your life and the strength that he gives. Can you, yeah. can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's so encouraging to me. So working through the, the darkest times of life, um, there was instances where, you know, I didn't think that I would make it. Mm -hmm. And leaning on Christ and being with my supportive family, mm -hmm. um, I know that God wrote that story. Right. And he knew exactly what I was going to go through. Right. And God watching out for me. Um, if I didn't put my faith in him, I, I wouldn't have survived. Right. So believing in Jesus is the only way that uh, I've made this trip through. Like you have stated in many of your messages here just recently, God is writing a story that's more beautiful than I could ever write for myself. Right. So how could I not have Christ as my Savior? How right. could I not lean on Him and, and follow Him and share what mm -hmm. we're sharing today with others who might have the same 
same history. Right. Um, as I've mentioned to our church family, you and I have become friends, and so I, I know a little bit more about your personal faith, and it's very real and very genuine. And one of the things that I uh, appreciate the most about you is um, is that you're a guy, you're a tough guy. You've been through a lot, you were trained, you were special forces, you've jumped out of airplanes, um, but yet you have a soft heart and a sensitive heart toward the Lord. Many people believe that the more manly you are, the stronger you are, the harder it is to, to walk with God and to have that genuine faith, but yet it doesn't yeah. seem to be a conflict for you at all. No, sir. Um, what's, uh, what is your personal relationship with Jesus like? Yeah. So several times, you know, hunting trips, uh, sitting in a tree stand, I, I would talk to God just like he was a friend, just like we are right now yeah. and asking, you know, why did I go through those things? Yeah. Am I broken? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not normal what I've gone through Yeah. and, and knowing that he's right there. So in the dark times that you mentioned, the times when you were, you know, not sure that, that you wanted to go on, and I think that's a, it takes a lot of courage to, to even talk about that. And, you know, you've talked to me about how God met you there. Um, Psalm 23 talks about the valley of the shadow of death, and more than once in your life, you've, you've lived that. You've been yes, through sir. it, both in your service to our country and your deployments, but also after you've come home. Mm -hmm. And when you've met the Lord there and he's moved you through that, um, you know, to me, that's just such an encouragement to my faith and uh, just reinforces the reality that, yeah. that God is real and he that is. he cares, you he know, uh, and that he's our comforter, our yes. provider. And in many ways, he's sustained your life and brought you through for a purpose. Uh, and I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. So for many veterans who've served and are struggling like, like you uh, have and, and sometimes probably are, what message would you give them today on Veterans Day? Put your trust in Christ. Uh, he will walk you through mm -hmm. any of the dark times, mm -hmm. through the shadows of the valley of death. Yeah. Uh, lean on Him and His grace and His forgiveness. It's not about manlyhood. It's not about masculinity. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. You know, strong men with soft hearts. That's that's what it's all about. And that's what my desire for our men at Capital City Church, for us to continue to become strong men with compassionate and soft hearts. God's also led you, uh, Keith, to some resources that have, you know, have helped you out as yes, well, or tools that God can use yep. to help bring wholeness and recovery. And uh, there may be some folks there that are struggling even right now who've served our country and you know, might not know what to do next. Yes, um, you have a message for them. You need to reach out to the local VA, no matter where you're at, Mission 22 has been uh, a supportive avenue for veterans. Mm -hmm. 22 soldiers a day commit suicide. Their mission is to end veteran suicide. Yeah. And they have an outreach program as right. well. And so we'll put that information on our screen right now. Yes. And, and my prayer is, as your prayer, uh, that it reaches somebody if they need to hear that. Yes, because we don't want any more tragedies for people who have served their country faithfully so that we can enjoy opportunities like this today, yep. right now. And find a friend that you can share with. Yeah. Things that we've gone through, they're, they're not normal. Right. They're abnormal. It doesn't mean that we're broken. Right. It means that we need to have friends. And any of us is to reach out to me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm always here, here to listen. Right. And like our friendship, it's non-judgmental. Absolutely. Yeah, so. absolutely. Man, thank you so much for the courage to come and share. I know it's our church family. Still, it's hard to talk about things that are yes. personal. And uh, I, I genuinely appreciate it. Our church family appreciates it. Uh, we appreciate your service. Thank you for your thank service. You. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you. And uh, for all of you veterans out there, happy Veterans Day. Well, last week, I, I missed being with you guys during the prayer service. I was in Arkansas finishing up an important project to joy and to me. Um, I showed you some pictures a few weeks ago of me wiring a mini split air conditioner. If you saw that and how sketchy that was for me to try my, my hand at electrical work, you probably understand why I needed help this time to go finish up the project. And so I went um, and we spent six days and, and I worked for probably 12, 14 hour days, six days in a row. Didn't stop for lunch. My kids worked, my two boys in the evening when um, uh, they got off work. Uh, a friend of mine from church, Tom Pogansey, he went down and spent two days, uh, took some time 
time off and helped out. I put him in the attic. He was there 16 hours. At one point, there were nine people working on, on uh, this little, to call it a cabin would be auspicious. It would be an exaggeration. It's more like, it's the size of the first apartment that Joy and I had when we were in college. It's about 480 square feet, but um, we needed to get it finished and we did. We got it almost entirely 100% finished. Awesome experience with my kids but I was exhausted. I'm used to working this job. Uh, I go to the gym, but I'm not used to working, using the muscles and things that I, you have to use doing that kind of stuff. And um, my father-in-law calls them like useful muscles or working muscles. I didn't have any of those. I was sore. My back hurt. We got in the car, we're driving home and it's on Tuesday, Joy and I driving back. Election day. And, you know, we hadn't been part of the news. You know, we hadn't been really watching. We've been working. I mean, I've been literally, I mean, I'm working until I can't work anymore until the kids revolted and said it was time for bed. And uh, I, I texted Jared because Jared knows everything about the news. And, uh, and I said, Pastor, I didn't call him Pastor Jared. You know him as Pastor Jared. I said, hey, tell me what's going on. You know, we've been sort of out of touch. Do you know anything? You know, it was, the, it was election day. And, um, and I've been talking to some people on the phone, freaking out people, freaking out. What if... Trump wins. What if Kamala wins? What if the Democrat? What if the Republicans? I mean, just in despair. And um, I was really discouraged because it's important, really important, really important. But despair and joy, she looked at me and we were driving just out of rural Missouri into Kansas City. Such a drastic difference, right? When you're driving from the, I mean, cornfields and, you know, either direction, it's rural. Driving into Kansas City and, and Joyce says to me, she goes, Rick, I'm kind of scared. And I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, what if everybody's right? What if civilization ceases to exist because this person or that person or this happened or that happened? What if? And um, it was a valid question. As I've mentioned to you before, I'm a patriot. I love our country. The 27 great empires have risen and fallen and none of them thought they would. I've seen Red Dawn. Have you seen Red Dawn? I'm still mad at the Russians for what they did to Patrick Swayze. Um, that's, a, that's a, I know, it's a movie from my childhood, but I'm telling you, it was one of those movies. And, you know, uh, I told Joy, I'm like, look, I would be part of the resistance. And if I lived through it, I've got a plan. My boys and I, I mean, we're not preppers, but I've got a plan. But I said, really, I can imagine a post-America America. I don't want to. I love our country. I don't want to, but I can imagine it. I can, and, and I said, Joy, I said, if the worst happened, nothing changes for us because we still know who we are and we still know what we're supposed to do. Nothing changes. The circumstances change. The government changes. The persecution perhaps changes the difficulty level, the comfort level. And do I want that? No, but if it happened, I know who I am and friend, you do too. You're a citizen of the kingdom of God and you serve our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. And you know what you're supposed to do regardless of who the president is. And I was thinking about Old Testament stories, Old Testament stories, because I mean, governments came and went and nations rose and fell and the Israelites rose and fell and rose and fell and rose and fell. I mean, it's like watching a ping pong or tennis with those guys. And I was thinking about Daniel and I was thinking about the nation of Israel and really thinking about Daniel chapter one, because Daniel grew up along with three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Anybody know the third one for you churchies? Abednego, yeah. Uh, if you didn't grow up in church, forgive me. It's one of the stories that you learn when you're little and you keep learning it as you go. If you haven't heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, I, I will at some point teach that story. It's amazing. But these were four friends had grown up knowing the protections of a country, religious freedom. They enjoyed Jerusalem, enjoyed Israel. They enjoyed freedom of worship. They knew what their life was gonna look like for the next X number of years until one day it didn't. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, decided to invade, ransack Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, upended the way of life that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had known for their entire lives and kidnapped the best and the brightest. The worst had happened. The light 
was in danger of going out. The salt in danger of losing its saltiness. The bushel of Babylon was coming crashing down. And if you read the story, you realize that Nebuchadnezzar didn't do it through torture and imprisonment and bullying. Nebuchadnezzar with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was doing it through comfort, through low interest rates, through a better stock market, through lower gas and food prices, through a relative safety and security and the ability to see the future. And while all these things can be good things, what he was trying to do, Nebuchadnezzar, was he was getting them drunk under the influence of the barometers, the things in life that yes, make life easier but can make us start acting like we're citizens of another country, not the kingdom of God. And that was his plan. And that's what I'm afraid of. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it and did all the things I told you that he did. You can read that for yourself. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and from nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. He was to indoctrinate them, to educate them, to feed them, to give them food that had been offered to false gods and idols, but lavish food, all the wine they wanted, a lifestyle that most people dream about. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, one drink at a time, not realizing that they were past the legal limit that an outside influence was beginning to affect their internal thought process and behavior. And that slowly over time, they would lose their mission, their focus. And they would serve Babylon and not the Lord. And after that, they were supposed to serve the king. Among them who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azari, the chief official even gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. And then verse eight is what I want you to pay attention to. Because this is what we've been doing all year. I want to get up here close to you guys because this is what's important. We're almost done. What's it say in verse eight? But Daniel resolved... Do you see that? But Daniel resolved not to be under the influence of the bushel of Babylon. He resolved to be different. I talked to you in January about resolutions that you were going to make so that we could be different this year, physical res uh, resolutions. I talked to you about relational resolutions. I talked to you about spiritual resolutions. I told you if you would just stick around, if you would just come and lean in, if you would continue just to be with this church family, that this year you would grow, you'd be a different person at the end of the year than you were at the beginning, that you would be more like Jesus. And many of us have done that. We resolved but what does it take when you make a resolution? What well, takes resolve, discipline, you've got to follow through. Um, this last week in Arkansas, this is confession time. Um, and I blame my wife, it's her fault, right? I'll just tell you ahead of time, it's Joy's fault. Uh, I, I resolved at the beginning of the year, like I have for several years, that I would stay on my diet this year and that I would work out and I have a certain goal of how many times I'm gonna work out and do cardio. Nobody else cares, nobody except I care. And um, I just keep track. And, and I've been really good on my diet. Matter of fact, I was 100% on my diet until Wednesday. 
and it's my wife's fault. So we were working. I was tired. I have all the excuses in the world. I was, um, you know, doing this, these 12 to 14 hour days. And, 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 you know, I, it was, um, you know, excuses. And Joy bought junk food because junk food keeps the kids going. You know that, right? If you got kids, you just give them some junk food, some sugar. It just keeps them going. Just give them a little bit, keeps them going. The problem is, and the project we're working on is on some property that's right, you know, it's next to my son's house where he lives. And she put the junk food in the kitchen, in Nathan's kitchen, and she bought Pop-Tarts, which used to be my nemesis, Pop-Tarts. And I walked through the kitchen and nobody was there. I looked out the window, I really did, and no one was looking. And then I looked at the box and it was already open. And I wish I could tell you I didn't, but I ate a Pop-Tart. I didn't know what to do. No, that's bad. That's for you. It's between you and Jesus if you eat Pop-Tarts. For me, it was a resolution. I didn't know what to do. I texted Jared, Pastor Jared. And I'm like, I got to confess to somebody. And I said, I ate a Pop-Tart, but I worked a 12 hour day. I didn't know. I felt like when I walked outside that, you know, something had changed. And to be perfectly honest with you, Jesus put two Pop-Tarts in a package and I ate both. <laughs> I couldn't even make it through a six day work week without falling under the pressures of Babylon. But Daniel resolved. He resolved to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. And sometimes prosperity can be our biggest enemy as well as defeat. And regardless of whether or not you felt victory on Tuesday or personal defeat, the dangers of the bushel of Babylon loom large. Have you been affected? Let's go through a few things before we close, just so we can make sure. What entertains you? Is what entertains you consistent with the kingdom of God and pleasing to God? Or is it affected by culture? Determined by culture, what's around you? And by the way, I sit with you during this list, not over you. Oftentimes we're entertained by things that aren't even consistent to being citizens of the kingdom of God. How do I spend my money? Jesus talked about that so much. You wanna know where your heart is? Look at what you do with your funds. And it's easy to know that there's some that are still living under the bushel of Babylon because every Thursday when our finance team counts the offering, we wonder if we pay the bills the next week. It happens. What do I say? What do I post? Or what do I share? Is it under the influence of Jesus Christ and consistent with a member of the the kingdom of God? Or is it under the influence of culture? I remember a day, I'm getting old because I gripe about, you know, oh, the good old days when I was a kid. Some things were good, some things were bad, right? One of the things that was good is when I was a kid, you weren't allowed to talk about who you were gonna vote for. Do you remember that? None of you grew up in a house where you weren't allowed to talk about who you were gonna vote for? Was that just a Southern thing? I wasn't allowed to ask. In school, you couldn't ask. I remember I asked my grandmother one time who she was gonna vote for and my dad and mom told me that wasn't appropriate, that she could tell me if she wanted to. My parents explained who they were gonna vote for and why and they were principled and they were biblical and they informed me. But when I went to school and we had our little elections, one of the rules was you couldn't tell anybody who you were gonna vote for. Why? Because they knew it caused division. They knew it ruined friendships. They knew it divided families. I know as a Christian that it, if we're not careful and we overshare in inappropriate ways, that we lose our saltiness and we extinguish our light. But I lived back in a time where you couldn't talk about politics, but you did talk about your faith. But now so many of us are afraid to ask anybody about their faith, but within five minutes, we know what party they are with and who they're gonna vote for. And it's backwards, it's reversed. And we're living as citizens of the kingdom of Babylon, not the kingdom of God. So what have you said over the last few weeks and months? How have you treated your family, the people closest to you? What about the conversations with people who maybe you know at work, maybe you don't know? What have you posted on social media? What have you texted? I know that some of us need to apologize. 
Because your temper and fear and frustration got the best of your testimony and your witness. And perhaps we alienated some people who desperately need to see Jesus and hear a whole lot less about our opinions. And an apology should be as public as the offense. And that's a hard one. Well, where does my self-image come from? Do I look to the world around me for my self-image? Do I look to Babylon? Do I look to, you know, what's popular, social media, how many likes, who says what? Where does my self-image come from? If you're a citizen of the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ is your king, your self-image comes because you are a son or daughter of the Lord most high. What do I do for fun? And then finally, what controls my attitude and my optimism? I guess this is where I was the most profoundly surprised because despair is a word that I would say that I heard from many Christians, regardless of which side of the political aisle they sat on, at the thought of losing an election. And disappointment is perfectly fair. As I've mentioned, it's critically important but can you not imagine a life beyond that? Is who you are and what you do so tied to what you experience and who's in power that we can't think beyond that? As a citizen of the kingdom of God, we think beyond that and it extinguishes the fear. But if we live according to these things, we're susceptible to every fear mongering rumor, every Facebook share, every post, every person who whispers in our ear. And we find that we only listen to people who think the way we do and we become more afraid and more angry and more frustrated and we push everyone else away and pretty soon Satan wins and the gospel disappears. But Daniel resolved in his heart. He resolved to live a different way. So I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to play games with God. I don't want to play games with God. When we resolve, it takes discipline. And discipline means that sometimes we do something today that we don't necessarily want to do so that tomorrow we can enjoy something that we want more than what we feel like we want in the moment. Discipline, we've talked a lot about it. We work at everything. If I said, I want to get in shape, I'm going to go to the gym one time a month. Somebody would laugh at you, right? Oh, I'm going to diet. I'm going to lose some weight. I'm going to eat right one time a week, but the rest of the time I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I want a great marriage with my wife. And so I'm going to be nice to her on Thursdays from six to seven. And that's it. But we treat our spiritual life like that. I'll go to church if I feel like it, if nothing else is in the way, if I don't have any schedule conflicts, if my kids aren't busy, if I, you know, if it's, you know, then, then we'll go. We all read my Bible if I get in trouble or maybe if I'm bored if I have this question that somebody's asked me at work, I'll pray. But I mean, only if really, you know, stuff, I mean, prayer, I mean, you know, we don't resolve, we react. And we let the pressures of the bushel of Babylon toss us around, like James says, like a ship without a rudder in the middle of a storm. And we wonder why we feel and act the way we do. Citizens of the kingdom of God act differently. They feel differently. Their confidence comes from a different place. So I want you to think of one thing, not 10 things, not five things, not three things. One thing, easy peasy, one thing that you think in your life you may have allowed to fall under the bushel of Babylon. You know what I'm saying, I hope by now. The culture that we live in, in America, in the world, in your own life. One thing that you know shouldn't be that way. And I want you to resolve right now before the Lord. And if you got to tell somebody else to make it happen, make it happen. And live a different way. Because yesterday is gone and regret can be a powerful motivator because you and I are finishing the year strong. We have, I mean, not even two months. We got like six weeks left, right? Before the end of the year. But we're going to finish so strong and we're gonna to get to the end of the year and we're gonna celebrate a year where God has done something in you and through you. 
that's so much greater than we ever imagined 12 months before. And we will turn the corner into 2025 and we will have the best year ever. So let's do that together. Father, thank you for my friends and I pray that you would be with them that you would comfort them, that you would correct them if necessary, as I have prayed that you would correct me. We say we're citizens of the kingdom of God, but we live like we're citizens of this world. And I do thank you for our country, Father. I thank you for the men and women who have bravely fought to defend our freedoms, the noble causes that provide us the ability to be in a place like this, to say the name Jesus, to have a Bible and not be worried about government intervention, imprisonment, or death. All those things are so valuable, Father. And I thank you for our country. But most of all, I thank you that our citizenship is with you and it's in heaven. That our King, that our President, that our Lord is Jesus Christ. And I pray that we would live that way. So show us where it is we may have strayed, Father. Give us the courage to resolve in at least one of these areas to live a different way. For your glory, not for ours, so that you can continue to build in us what it is you're doing. Us as individuals and us as a church. And Father, I love this church. I love my friends. I'm so grateful that I get to be here with my church family, doing what we do together in a group. And I cannot wait to see what you continue to do as we just want to glorify you and you alone. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Stand.